uh, and, and so just so people kind of have an understanding of, of where I come from, right? So the, the webinar today is structural inspection using ground penetrating radar. Uh, I'm the president of Bigman Geophysical, a uh, company that's out there basically trying to provide training technology and project support for uh, companies that are engaged in non-destructive testing, geophysics, uh, locating and mapping, things like that. I graduated from the University of Georgia and I taught for a few years at Georgia State University uh, as a lecturer. Um, I'm currently an associate editor of Fast Times, which is a trade magazine for the North American uh, Association called Engineering and Environmental uh, Geophysics Society. Uh, I'm a former board member of the Engineering and Environmental Geophysics Society. Mm -hmm. uh, I founded uh, LearnGPR.com, which is sort of dedicated to provide accessible and useful information to ground penetrating radar users. I created something called the GPR Boot Camp, which we've had over a thousand attendees across four continents uh, since I started it four years ago. And, uh, and I wrote a book called GPR Basics, a handbook for ground penetrating radar users. And so basically what should be coming out from this little list is uh, like I said to begin, I'm here uh, to help people and we're doing whatever we can to get as much good information in the hands of users of ground penetrating radar and other inspection technologies uh, as possible. Right? We want you to be better. Uh, we all can be better. We all can grow. And that's what we want for you. So let's sort of uh, uh, jump into it then. Um, so Bigman Geophysical has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Uh, credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to the RCEP at rcep.net. Uh, a certificate of completion uh, can be issued to each participant, uh, and as such, it does not include content that will be deemed or, or construed to be an approved or endorsement of RCEP. This is my content. The point is, what I'm showing you today is how I teach it and, and projects that we worked on. Um, but you'll be able to go to rcep.net and uh, get your uh, uh, credits uh, from there, and you should have a, an account and a log uh, in from RCEP. So what's the purpose of the learning today? Uh, the purpose of this activity is to help course participants, that's all of you, uh, compare the uses and range of abilities, as well as limitations of GPR in structural analysis and applying them to the leading in structural problems in the United States. So uh, to do this, you're gonna have to go through a couple things and at the end of the presentation, you all should be able to, to, to do the following, which is number one, categorize some of the leading structural problems in the US. So there are people on this webinar I know uh, from all around the world. Uh, I promise your stuff is falling apart too. And so, but I live in the US and we'll focus on, on the US. Um, but to categorize the leading structural problems in the United States, uh, explain the fundamentals of how GPR technology works. So we'll go do an overview of, of the sort of fundamental physics of it. Uh, you should be able to describe the range of applications for GPR in structural analysis. And then finally, we'll end um, with a comparison of the benefits and limitations of GPR technology and an assessment of what other technologies are available that may complement GPR at points or projects where GPR struggles. So those are the four uh, things that you should be able to do by the end of this presentation. Okay, so what are the problems in the U.S.? 72 dams, including hydroelectric dams, are being removed each year in the U.S. due to possible dam failure. Uh, we derive a lot of energy from hydroelectric dams and, uh, and having to close hydroelectric dams is or can create problems. And so having to close 72 dams a year in the U.S. Uh, uh, is a real struggle is a lot of input that has to go into dealing with that. And it's because these dams are deteriorating, deteriorating at a rapid uh, uh, rate. And that's a, that's a problem question is which dams are the ones that need to be removed, which ones can be refurbished, which ones can continue or extend their use life. 54,259 bridges in the U.S. are categorized as structurally deficient. So this is the worst case uh, um, for a bridge uh, to be categorized as structurally deficient, and that's about almost 10% of the bridges in the U.S. This does not include bridges that are deteriorating, but not categorized as structurally deficient. There's quite a few of those. Um, but this is, a, again, another real problem. This is a problem to people's safety and the communities that we all uh, work in and the roads that we all drive on. Uh, according to the American Society for Civil Engineering, four million miles, that's six zeros, after the four. Four million miles of road in the US are in need uh, of repair. That's a lot of, of, of road. 
Uh, and then finally, 51 nuclear reactors in the U.S. And these are generally concrete structures <clears throat> and revolve concrete uh, uh, structures around it, whose initial license expired between 2000 and 2015. What are we going to do with these nuclear reactors? These are major capital investments to build a new nuclear reactor. And if one goes down uh, and can't be used anymore, again, that's a limit on energy. And so how do we handle these reactors that uh, licenses expire, and which ones can we deem as being accessible for uh, renewed licenses, which ones can be refurbished in order to have longer use lives, and which ones really have to get decommissioned. Uh, in order to inspect these, we need some tools that are uh, non-destructive, right? So how can we com combat these issues? Well, we would use non-destructive testing, right? One of these uh, non-destructive testing techniques, and probably in my mind, uh, the most dynamic and useful is going to be ground penetrating radar. Doesn't mean it's the only one out there and we'll address this at the end, but it's very dynamic. And I think you'll get out of this course or webinar um, just how, how many different ways it can be used. So non-destructive testing, that's how we're going to uh, combat the issues of inspecting all that road and reactors and dams and bridges uh, um, without disturbing them or damaging them even more. So let's go over a little bit of a basic of how uh, GPR works, right? a little bit of an overview. So the way that GPR works is it generates an electro, uh, electromagnetic pulse, okay? Um, basically it produces an electromagnetic wave from an antenna. The antenna oscillates an electron back and forth in a sense to, to, to generate that wave and, you know, certainly the the electrical engineers might beat me up over that description, but that's the way that I, you know, kind of uh, explain it. And so what happens is when it generates this electromagnetic wave, that wave propagates through the subsurface and it will continue to travel uh, until one of two things happens. Either it deteriorates the signal, right, the material it's moving through, or it encounters a discontinuity. When it encounters a discontinuity, such as uh, steel reinforcement, um, that EM wave is going to reflect off of that discontinuity. Depending on what the discontinuity is made of, some of the energy may reflect back and some may continue on into the subsurface. And this is what allows GPR to be potentially a 3D technology, uh, a true 3D technology. So in this case, if we take a look again, and the GPR puts out a signal, that signal reflects off of something like a conduit uh, or some other thing embedded in the concrete, and it reflects off of that and comes back and gets recorded by the GPR. What does that actually look like on the GPR screen? So here's what it looks like. This is what we call an A scan. An A scan is a wiggle trace, there's another name for it, or a one dimensional view, which approximates what's going on below the GPR itself. So it'll record two way travel time, it'll record uh, ampl amplitude, which is how much energy comes back. Um, it'll record polarity of that energy, and this is what it produces. It produces a wiggle at that location, representing what's below the GPR at that location. Well, if you push the GPR across your concrete slab, and you push it across an embedment like a conduit, you'll get what's known as a B-scan or profile. Right? This is the actual two-dimensional perspective of what's going on. And in this case, this is a conduit that uh, we, we recorded a reflection from. And when you have a cylindrical object embedded in concrete, it'll generally produce a hyperbolic reflection geometry. So you can move from these A scans and uh, uh, imply them as, as what we call B scans in 2D if you push the GPR across the surface. And that's because the GPR has wheels and the odometer in one of those wheels or on all of those wheels is going to tell the GPR when it's supposed to put out the next pulse and record the next A scan. Well, if you have a bunch of 1D next to each other, what does it produce? A 2D. Now, finally, if you record a bunch of these 2Ds profiles next to each other, you can uh, resynthesize the information from the top down and actually look at slices into the subsurface. And that's what we're seeing here as a C scan or a pseudo 3D or a time slice. Um, these are the three basic visualizations of ground penetrating radar when uh, inspecting anything, but certainly in including concrete. So an A scan, 1D, a B scan, 2D, and a C scan, which is 
3D, and they all give some benefit or information that can be useful to the field technician. That's how GPR generally works. That's how it records information, sends a signal through the subsurface, it reflects off of some discontinuity, gets recorded by the GPR. When you push it along uh, and it collects a bunch of those, it'll create a profile. And if you collect a bunch of profiles, you can re-sample uh, the data in a three-dimensional or pseudo 3D perspective. All right, so what are the things that are going to uh, um, affect the performance of the GPR in any given circumstance? We'll go through a few of these pieces now. Permittivity and wave velocity are two critical factors when conducting ground penetrating radar inspections. So permittivity is the ability for a material to displace bound electric charges when an electric field is present. Okay, the ability to displace bound electric charges when an electric field is present. The more bound charges a material has, the more stuff the GPR wave has to displace. Okay, so the more it has to displace, the slower it's going to move through the material. So what is the permittivity of some different materials? Well, for air, the permittivity is one, and this is the lowest permittivity value for any material. And so how much uh, bound electric charges does air have, or how many? It has none. It has no bound electric charges. What about water? Well, water has a permittivity of 81, which is very high, and it's because it has lots of bound charges. So in which one of these materials is the GPR wave going to move faster through? It's going to move faster through air. It's actually going to move fastest through air because it has to displace no bound charges, and you can't move faster than I don't have to displace anything. So it moves fastest through air. It's going to move slowest through water. Uh, the only materials that have a higher permittivity than water are really some metals, um, including steel, which is embedded often in concrete. Uh, but where does concrete come into the picture then? Right? What is the permittivity of concrete and how fast or slow will a GPR wave move in concrete? Well, concrete has some bound charges in it. Okay? It doesn't have none, it doesn't have a lot, it's got some. What's gonna derive how much it has? It's gonna be how much water is still in that concrete slab or wall or structure or whatever. Okay? How much water is still in there? So what's gonna affect the permittivity and wave velocity in concrete? When was the concrete cured, right? Was it just laid down a couple weeks ago? It's still gonna have a lot of water retained in it. Uh, is it outside and you live in an area that's very moist? It's gonna have more, more moisture in it. Is it inside and it was laid down six years ago and it's not been exposed to the elements? It may have a lot less water in it and your wave might move faster. And so uh, this is sort of the range of dry to wet concrete, about three to 10, at least this is what we have seen on the projects that we've done. And so concrete has some, and that's gonna affect how fast or slow your wave is gonna move. It's also gonna affect how, in some ways, how deep the wave is gonna go. Uh, but understanding how fast the wave is moving is going to allow the technician to give a good estimate or potentially a good estimate for depth of a given target or something like that. Um, and so this is, this is how it kind of looks, right? On the right-hand side, um, or, or, or the gray area, it's moving fast, it's, it, that's dry concrete. On the blue uh, side, it's filled with water, and so it's slower concrete. And so it still is going to record information off of targets at the same depth, but it's gonna take longer for the wave to actually return back to the GPR itself. Okay, the next set of, 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 of characteristics uh, that are gonna affect the performance of the GPR wave is gonna be conductivity, which leads to signal decay. So uh, conductivity is the ability for a material to transfer free electric charges when an electric field is present. And as the GPR puts out a pulse, it's going to hold up longer in less conductive material. So in the dry concrete, in this example, the GPR wave is going to have the ability to reflect off of the target and come back. And in the wet concrete, it may or may not end up making it back to the GPR. Okay, it's also gonna depend on how wet it is and how deep the target of interest is. But the greater the water content in the concrete or the greater the moisture content in the concrete, the faster the GPR wave strength is going to deteriorate. So conductivity has a huge effect on GPR performance. And sometimes if you have something embedded in the bottom of a slab and the slab happens to be two feet thick, 
you could struggle potentially to see it, especially if you have moisture within that structure.